Hello, everybody. So today uh, we are really happy to welcome Hamun in our uh, AlgoComp seminar. And so Hamun is a PhD student at Columbia University, and broadly speaking, he is working in non local games. And today he is going to present part of this work. And so, yeah, uh, for people that might have seen uh, something like that at uh, QAP, uh, they can use this option to, uh, so they can use the talk today to ask as many questions as they, as they want to Hamun. And yeah, so thank you for joining us in these early morning hours for you. And so the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so yes, the talk is going to be about non-local games and uh, some computational problems associated with them and their relative hardness. It is a joint work with uh, Sayed Sajjad Nejadi, who is now a second year PhD student at the University of Maryland and Henry Yuan. So uh, let's begin uh, with the simplest of non-local games, the CHSH game. You most likely have uh, seen this game before. Uh, we have a referee and two cooperating players, Alice and Bob. The referee samples uh, questions X and Y for, for Alice and Bob respect, respectively. And um, Alice and Bob cannot communicate uh, once the game starts. So Alice only sees question X and Bob only sees question Y. And once they receive these questions, Alice and Bob each respond with a bit as their answers. And uh, the winning condition is that uh, the sum of their answers modulo two uh, should be equal to the product of their questions. And so maybe, maybe I should pause for a second here. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure how this seminar is usually run, but uh, um, you don't have to wait till the end of the uh, talk in order to ask your question. You can pause me at any time if, if you'd like, uh, and I'd be happy to go into more details. So um, let's talk about strategies uh, that Alice and Bob can employ to play, to play such a game, to play the CHSH game. A tensor product strategy, um, which is the main type of strategies we're going to see in this talk, uh, consists of uh, the following. So there are two finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, HA and HB, a unit vector psi in the tensor product of these two Hilbert spaces. And for each of Alice's questions, uh, a measurement acting on her Hilbert space HA, and similarly, a measurement for every one of Bob's questions. So this constitutes a strategy uh, for, for, uh, for the players. And uh, we have this notation, we show uh, uh, the, the winning probability of, of this strategy uh, is shown by omega CHSH of S. And uh, the most important quantity uh, associated to a game uh, is the value. And it's denoted by omega star, which is the supremum of winning probability over all possible strategies. Now, it is well known that there is a two dimensional strategy, meaning that there, there is a strategy consisting of two dimensional Hilbert spaces, HA and HB that wins with probability point 85. It is also well known that uh, this simple two-dimensional strategy is optimal. But that is something that is not immediately obvious. Why can't Alice and Bob uh, improve their winning probability by going to a larger Hilbert space? The space of uh, possible strategies is really limitless after all. Well, in the case of CHSH, uh, we are lucky. And, and with some mathematical ingenuity, uh, we can show that the two-dimensional strategy uh, is really the optimal play. Uh, but the situation is not at all clear when we go uh, to a game with a much larger question and answer sets and, and one that has a very complicated rule set. 
So this motivates uh, the following question. And given a game G, how hard it is to compute its value? Well, our initial discussion about CHS search tells us that uh, at least at an intuitive level, uh, computing the value of a game is hard. And uh, this very well matches uh, the theory. Oh. Slavstra in 2016 uh, showed us that the value of a game is uncomputable, meaning there does not exist an algorithm that finds the value of every single game. You also may have heard of MIP story calls RE result that came in 2020. Um, the content of that theorem tells us that even approximating the value of a game up to uh, half is, is uncomputable. So the question is now, is that the end of the story? Um, my hope is that in this talk, I can convince you that there are some more interesting things uh, that are going on. Uh, we see how uncomputable problems about non-local games, like the exact value and approximate value problems I just mentioned, can be uncomputable in, uh, in comparable ways. And we see how this distinction uh, can give us some interesting new insight in the study of Entanglement. So now I have to give you a crash course on computability theory. This is the theory that gives us the language and the tools to compare the degrees of uncomputability of problems. You may have heard of the halting problem. It is a decision problem. This means that we are given two sets. The yes instances are Turing machines that halt, and the no instances are Turing machines that do not halt. The problem asks, given a Turing machine, decide whether it is a yes instance or a no instance. Uh, this, is, this is a notoriously difficult problem. We know that it is uncomputable. There is another problem uh, called the non-halting problem, where we just switch the labels, yes and no. So in the non-halting, the yes instances are those three machines that do not halt. Uh, also related, these two problems are fundamentally different. They are different in the following sense. We cannot reduce one of these problems to the other. Well, what is a reduction between two problems anyway? Uh, a reduction is an algorithm. Uh, that sends yes instances to yes instances and no instances to no instances. Uh, so um, I won't prove it to you, but take my word for it that there is no reduction from uh, halting to non-halting, nor is there a reduction in the other direction. So these two problems are really different. That's going to uh, constitute the basis uh, of our talk, like we're going to build build from this uh, this simple fact from computability theory that these two problems are fundamentally different. So sorry, what kind of reductions do you allow? Um, so you can imagine uh, uh, car production, many to one reductions, uh, right? So you, uh, you you can you can send the yes instances of the halting to yes instances and no instances to no instances, and it's as many to one. Yeah, and in any time we wish, as long as it's computable. Yes, yes, even even say like, yeah, computable, yes. Um, any any computable, any any algorithm, right? Uh, but you wouldn't lose that much if you, if you restrict yourself to polynomial time algorithms, for example. Mm -hmm. Very good question, thank you so much. Uh, all right, so now let's go back to non-local games. Um, uh, we, we now define a decision problem uh, that we will be seeing a lot in this talk. It's called the exact value problem. The, the, the set of yes instances is the set of all games with value one, and the no instances are all those games with value strictly less than one. This is called, this decision problem is called the exact value problem because of this intuition. Uh, 
if I could compute the value of a game exactly, then I could solve this decision problem very easily. That's why I call this the exact value problem. As mentioned earlier, Slavstra showed that the exact value problem is uncomputable. He's done so by reducing the non-halting problem to the exact value problem. I hope uh, the fact that this reduction exists uh, immediately tells you that uh, the exact value problem is uncomputable. Because if I could solve the exact value problem, then because of the reduction, I can solve the non-halting problem. And we know that that is impossible. We also uh, learned about this approximate value problem. This is another decision problem um, where the set of yes instances is, is again, all those games with value one, but the no instances now are those games with value strictly less than half. Again, we call this approximate value because if I could approximate the value of the game, then I can solve this decision problem very easily. Now, the MIP study calls RE result showed that approximate value problem is uncomputable by a reduction from the halting problem. So here, here are all the problems that we learned about so far and the reductions between them. So halting reduces to approximate value and non-halting reduces to exact value. What other arrows can I draw here immediately? Well, one observation we can make is that uh, we can easily solve the approximate value problem if we could solve the exact value problem, right? So trivially, there is a reduction from approximate value to exact value. But so far, this doesn't tell me that the exact value is harder, is strictly harder than the approximate value. For all we know, there could be a non-trivial reduction from exact value to approximate value, in which case the two problems would have equivalent hardness. What I'm going to do in the next slide is to refute this possibility. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, we learned there is a reduction from the halting to approximate value. But it turns out there is a reduction in the other direction as well. So these two problems, halting and approximate value, are really equivalent. So let me show you this reduction in the other direction, the reduction from approximate value to halting. So uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm given a game uh, and I need to produce a Turing machine. The Turing machine is the following. It enumerates over all dimensions, D, one by one starting from dimension one. For every dimension, check all quantum strategies of that dimension and calculate their winning probability for, for the given game, G. If we ever reached a winning probability strictly larger than half, then stop and say yes. So I had a game, I produced this Turing machine from this game, okay? This is the reduction. Uh, you might ask, there is a, there is a problem here. Uh, there are uncountably many strategies, even in two dimensions. Luckily, there is a way to discretize the set of quantum strategies of any dimension. Indeed, we can cover the set of all strategies of a fixed dimension by a finite number of epsilon balls. So without going to further detail, this, this is really is not a problem. We can discretize the set of the strategies. Now, uh, what are the properties of this Turing machine that we just constructed? Well, this Turing machine halts if and only if the game has value one. If the game has value one, it means that there is a dimension D such that there is a perfect strategy in that dimension and this Turing machine will eventually find that strategy and done, it halts. Um, so we have the desired reduction that we claim from the approximate value to halting. Now, this Turing machine this, uh, this, uh, is called a semi-algorithm. 
it, uh, it is known uh, as the search from below algorithm because uh, by following it, we can approach the value of a game from below, right? We, are, we start with dimension one, dimension two, dimension three, and uh, we approach the value of the game from, from below. But one thing to note is that this is not an algorithm. We call it a semi-algorithm because uh, on no instances, this process uh, never halts. Uh, it is only guaranteed to succeed, succeed on yes instances, hence why we call it a semi-algorithm. It just uh, works in, uh, for, for, uh, for half of the instances. And here is a diagram that shows the, you know, the search from below. All right, so. Now, um, since uh, the approximate value and halting are equivalent, uh, and exact value is as hard as both halting and non-halting, we get that uh, halting and uh, 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 by following this path from non-halting, starting from non-halting, you can go to exact value by reduction, then from exact value, uh, if, if there was a reduction to approximate value, you can go to approximate value and then you can go to halting. That means that non-halting and halting, uh, uh, there is a reduction between them, which cannot happen. So this refutes the possibility of there existing a reduction from exact value to approximate value. Therefore, uh, exact value is really strictly harder than the approximate value. The arrow can, from exact value to approximate value cannot exist. So in our paper, we showed that something stronger is true. Imagine a parallel universe in which we could solve the halting problem, the approximate value problem, and non-halting problem. In this imaginary world, you could solve all these three problems. We showed that even in this parallel universe, there is no algorithm for the exact value problem. This tells you how much more difficult the exact value problem is compared to the approximate value problem. So now let's take a step back and, um, and uh, study the assumptions that went into defining a strategy for, for, for example, the CHSH game. Uh, in the strategy I described to you for CHSH, we assume the overall Hilbert space is the tensor product of Alice's Hilbert space and Bob's Hilbert space. This is, uh, that is we implicitly assumed uh, Alice's measurement operators act only on Alice's qubits and Bob's measurement operator acts on Bob's uh, qubits. This is called the tensor product model for strategies. But the landscape of computational problems for non-local games and their complexities is even more colorful than we just discussed because there is this other uh, set of quantum strategies we can talk about. And I'm going to introduce, you to, uh, uh, introduce that to you uh, in the next slide. So the commuting operator strategies, in contrast with tensor product strategies, consist of one single Hilbert space H that could possibly be infinite dimension. It also consists of a unit vector psi in this Hilbert space. And now Alice's operators, measurement operators, could act on all of this Hilbert space. And similarly, Bob's operators can act anywhere in every corner of this, this Hilbert space. But there is one restriction. We require that Alice's operators and Bob's operators commute with one another. This commutativity ensures the no communication requirement of non-local games. I am told that this model is motivated by quantum field theories, but don't ask me how, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so we define the, the commuting operator uh, value of a game to be uh, the supremum of 
winning probability over all commuting operator strategies. And we denote it by omega co of G. So this is in contrast with omega star of G, which was the finite dimensional or tensor product value of a game. So an example is that for CHSH, the commuting operator value and the tensor product value are the same. So just a few quick facts about, about commuting operator value. It should be clear that commuting operator value is always at least as large as the tensor product value because the set of possibilities, the set of possible strategies is, is larger. And uh, also in, in finite dimensions, uh, it is known that commuting operator strategies can always be turned into tensor product strategies with the same value. So from now on, just uh, think of tensor product strategies as finite dimensional commuting operator strategies. So the set of all, like you can just imagine this, uh, this Venn diagram of, of all commuting operator strategies and tensor strategies, tensor product strategies are just a finite dimensional subset of all commuting operator value strategies. Um, whether the tensor product uh, value and commuting operator value of all games are the same was a very important open problem uh, in our field known as the fearless, fearless on problem. One of the major consequences of MIP star equals RE is that it answers this problem. It says that there, uh, it, it tells us that there exists an explicit game G for which uh, the commuting operator value is strictly larger than uh, the finite dimensional value. So now that we know that these two values can be different, uh, we can define uh, the exact co-value problem where the yes instances are those games with uh, commuting operator value one and no instances are uh, those games with commuting operator value strictly less than one. Slavstra showed that the exact commuting operator value problem or exact co-value is uncomputable by a reduction from, again, the non-halting problem. So, the interesting thing is that there is, there is a reduction in the other direction as well. So one can also re reduce the exact co-value to the non-halting problem. Uh, and uh, this direction uses the, the, the famous MPA uh, paper, uh, uh, the content of which tells us this the theorem. There is a sequence of semi-definite programs, STPN, such that the nth STP um, is an upper bound for the commuting operator value of the game. And as n goes to infinity, it approaches the commuting operator value of the game. So uh, just like the search from below algorithm that we saw for the tensor product value of the game, there is an algorithm that uh, for, for the commuting operator value of the game that approaches the value from above. So this is the search from above semi-algorithm. Given a game G, calculate the answer TP for every N and reject if the answer STP has value strictly less than one, right? So this Turing machine, this algorithm is, is the reduction from the exact core value to non-halting. All right, so these two problems are really uh, equivalent. All right, so here again, the list of all problems that we saw, exact core value and non-halting as we mentioned in the previous slide are equivalent and approximate value and halting are equivalent. And this is telling us that exact value is strictly harder than both approximate value and exact co-value problem. All right, so 
Let's uh, focus on exact value and exact co-value for a second. The co-value is maximum winning probability over finite and infinite dimensional strategies. Whereas the game value is the maximum over finite dimensional strategies. Somewhat counterintuitively, we see that the case of finite dimensional value is strictly harder than uh, the case of infinite dimensional value. This tells us that the set of uh, finite dimensional strategies is, is more rebellious than, than the set of all the strategies. Also for, uh, for, 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 for the complexity theorists uh, in the audience, the interpretation of this phenomenon is, uh, is that uh, in, the, in the language of multi-prover interactive proof is that complexity of multi-prover interactive proofs collapses as we go from finite dimensional uh, provers to commuting operator provers. In other words, compared to finite dimensional provers, the commuting operator provers have more ways of conspiring against the verifier. So let us now introduce two classes of problems. Uh, the, the class, the first one is uh, the recursively and the set of recursively enumerable problems, uh, or RE. This is the set of all problems that have a semi-algorithm that halts on yes instances. Like a, an example of which is the search from below algorithm that we saw from before. Halting problem is an example of a complete problem for uh, the class RE. That is halting is in RE and every problem in RE reduces to the halting problem. Similarly, we define co-RE or complement of RE and that's the set of all problems that have a semi-algorithm that halts on no instances. So RE problems that have a semi-algorithm that halts on yes instances and co-RE those that halt on no instances. Non-halting is complete for co-RE. And uh, the sort of decidable problems are exactly the intersection of these two uh, complexity classes, R, E, and Quad. Now, from what we learned so far, approximate value is complete for R, E, because approximate value is, is equivalent to halting, as we uh, mentioned a few times so far. And exact co value is complete for co R, E. And I hope you understand that the, the co here. Uh, in exact co value and co RE are referring to different things. In co RE, co means complement, and in exact co value, co means commuting operator value. Uh, but, all right, so we see these two problems and these two classes, RE and co RE, uh, but where does the exact uh, value problem sit? So we talked about exact co value and approximate value, but we also define exact value. Exact value is in, in, uh, turns out to be complete for an entirely different class called Pi2 that is strictly contains both RE and co -RE. Uh, So in fact, there is an infinite hierarchy of these uncomputability classes uh, that contain harder and harder problems. And Pi2 is sitting at the second level of this hierarchy, whereas RE and CoRE are sitting at the first level of this hierarchy. And that's where exact value belongs to. That's, um, but by looking closely at, at this diagram, you see that there is something missing uh, from it. And that's the approximate co-value problem. What about approximating the commuting operator value of a game? Where, uh, where does that problem sit in this diagram? Well, approximation can never be harder than exact calculation, right? So, so we know that uh, the approximate co-value is somewhere inside co because it's, it's, it's easier than exact co-value. So it sits somewhere in co -RE, but where exactly we don't know. For all we know, it could be sitting somewhere between P space and query. 
the con the conjecture is that in fact the approximate co-value is is uh, complete for the class quark. But so far, nobody knows how to how to prove this. All right, so. Before we switch gear and, and, and uh, talk about how one might prove these uncomputability results, let me give you a quick application of, of, of our result. Um, our result settles the complexity of non-commutative polynomial optimization. So what's that? Let us start with uh, co the commutative polynomial optimization problem first. So in the commutative polynomial optimization problem, uh, we are maximizing a real polynomial subject to some polynomial inequality constraints. This problem is NP-hard and it sits inside uh, PS space. So there is always an algorithm for solving the commutative optimiz uh, polynomial optimization problem. And, and, and this follows a uh, this is a simple consequence of, of, of the uh, existential theory of reals, which, which was a very important result in, in theoretical computer science. I, th I think it came out in 1960s or so. Uh, now, the setting of non commutative polynomial optimization is very similar. Uh, here we have uh, polynomials P, Q1, Q2, all the way to QM in non-commutative variables. And we consider the following, this optimization problem. The supremum is taken over all finite dimensional Hilbert spaces uh, and uh, all unit vectors psi uh, in uh, the Hilbert space and bounded Hermitian operators X1 to Xn. And the, the polynomial inequalities are now with respect to the positive semi-definite cone. <clears throat> so it is a simple consequence of our result that this, this problem, the non-commutative optimization problem is complete for the class pi two. And the idea of the proof is that we can express the value of a game as a non-commutative polynomial optimization problem. That, that gives you one direction uh, of the proof. All right, so now we are going to switch gears and see how these reductions we mentioned earlier can be proved using something called compression. We show that we showed that all these results, all these reductions, all these arrows, even the conjectured one, which is uh, drawn with red here, can follow in a unified manner from compression theorems. The original idea of compression goes back to G from a paper in 2017. Over the next few years, this technique matured a lot. So eventually this technique of compression led to the proof of MIP star equals RE. There are many co different compression theorems. Next, I give you an example of a compression theorem that we proved in our paper. So in, in, in simple terms, uh, a compression theorem, compression theorem gives an algorithm. So the input to this algorithm is a game and the output is another game, a related game, G sharp. That is much simpler. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, simply speaking, that's, that's, that's what the comparison uh, algorithm is. So I have to define to, uh, for you what, 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 does, uh, what does it mean to be related and what does it mean to be simpler? Okay, related here means that if there is a relation between the value of the two games, in the input and output game, uh, more precisely, we want that if the value of the original game is one, we want the value of the compressed game, G, G sharp, to also be one. That's, that's what it means to be related. And simpler means that the complexity of the referee in G sharp is much smaller than the complexity of the referee in the game G. 
Okay, so th that's why we call it compression. We are, we are uh, inputting a game and we get a game that is simpler, uh, but is somehow related to the original game. Sorry, one question. How, how do you quantify complexity here? So uh, complexity here will be the uh, time complexity of the referee's procedure. So you can imagine the referee has, is a Turing machine, uh, is an algorithm, and it has a time complexity. We, that, that's, that's the complexity of the, um, of the referee. And being smaller means that the complexity of the referee in the G compressed, G sharp, is, is polylogarithmic in the running time of the referee in the original game. Uh, in MIT Star, how do we think about uh, what's the complexity of the referee polynomial? Yes, you can imagine it's a it's a polynomial time algorithm, and once you compress it, you get a uh, an algorithm uh, that that runs in logarithmic time, like n squared turns into log n or something like that. If that makes sense, and. Um... So, so the restriction is that, that if omega star of g is one, then omega star of g sharp should be one? Yes, yes, uh, something like that, right? You know, that's the basic thing that we require. We need a little bit more and we will see. Uh, but, but so just, just uh, imagine that the, the, the values of the two games should be related in some way. That's, that's what, what it means. Because, well, if you, you know, given a game G, you can always produce another game G compressed that is much simpler than the original game, but it could be that the two games are completely unrelated. You don't want that, right? That's, that's just a triviality. Uh, so now I lied to you a little bit in the previous slide to make, uh, to, to talk about compression theory, we need to talk about families of games, a uniform family of games, if we want to be precise. Uh, we're not gonna get into, uh, you know, um, too much technical details, but a, a really a compression theorem, uh, a compression algorithm rather, takes a family of games and outputs another family of games. So the theorem, one of the theorems that we proved, uh, one of the compression theorems we proved is the following. Um, there is a polynomial time algorithm, compress, uh, we call it compress, that takes description of a sequence of games Gn and produces a description of a sequence of games Gn compressed, so Gn sharp, such that the following hold, the referee of Gn compressed has a time complexity that is much smaller than uh, the complexity of the referee in GN, as we talked about. Uh, this is why we call this a compression procedure. And the values of GN and GN compressed are related in a predictable, predictable way. Namely, these two inequalities must, uh, these two uh, constraints must hold. One of them is just saying that if the value of the original game is less than one, the value of the compressed game must also be less than one. And the green one, that one on the top, is telling us that uh, the, the value of the compressed game is uh, lower bounded by this expression in the value of the original game. Um, in, in particular, it tells us that if the value of the original game is one, then half plus half is one. So the value of the compressed game is also one. Okay, so this is what we mean by being related. Any questions so far? Okay, um, so now, now I'm going to show you um, how to prove a Slavstra's result uh, using this compression theorem. Okay, so we're going to reprove Slavstra's result that exact value is uncomputable by a reduction from the non-halting problem. So I'm going to give an algorithm from non-halting to exact value, and I'm going to use compression theorem inside this algorithm. Okay, given a Turing machine T, we construct a sequence of games Gn for every integer n. The nth game in this family of games has the following description. 
the referee in the nth game simulates the Turing machine T for n steps. If the Turing machine halts in these n steps, then the referee rejects outright. Otherwise, the referee computes the compressed gain G sharp and plays the n plus first compressed game with the players. Very simple. It should be like these three steps are the steps that the referee takes in the the end game. So th there is this recursive uh, recursive thing, right? So it play it, it compresses the original games and it plays the next compressed game. I have a question. So uh, can, uh, so when you refer to family of games, so is there any specifics? Uh, really, so is there something specifically that relates these end games, or so it just is sequence of M, like any of M games? Uh, so very good question. So it's, it's a uniform family of games, meaning that I have a procedure that spits out, like I give it N and it spits out the Nth game, the description of the Nth game. There is a polynomial time algorithm. There is a polynomial time Turing machine that if I enter N into this machine, it produces the description of the Nth game. So, so these games are not just any sequence of games. They are related. Just like here, for example, uh, here I gave you the description for the nth game. It's a uniform description, right? For every n, you can just follow this description and find uh, uh, what, what this nth game is doing. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. All right, so now, uh, now here is the goal. Uh, uh, we just need to show that if the Turing machine, if this original Turing machine we started with halts, then the value of the first game in this sequence is a strictly less than one, right? So again, remember, I want to prove a reduction from non-halting to exact value. In non-halting, I have a Turing machine and in exact value, I have a game. I want this relation to hold. If the, if the Turing machine halts, if the Turing machine is a no instance of the non-halting problem, I want the game to be a no instance of the exact value problem, okay? I hope I'm not confusing anybody. It's just like, it's a very simple thing that we need to prove. Um, now, so here in the top, I have the description of the nth game. And I also stated the goal I want to show that if the Turing machine T holds, then the value of the first game is strictly less than one. So first imagine, there are two directions to this proof, right? I have to first, like, you know, just imagine first that T halts in three steps. Doesn't really matter in N steps, but imagine it halts in three steps for, for simplicity. Now on the left, I have this requirement, this, 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 this uh, property of the compression theorem. Right, you know, one part of the properties of the, you know, one uh, constraint of the compression theorem. It tells us that the, if the value of the original game is less than one, then the value of the compressed game is less than one. All right. So with all of these, let's let's uh, see the proof. All right. So start uh, starting with the third game. I know that the value of the third game must be zero. Why is that? Well, in the third game, the referee is simulating the Turing machine for three steps. And by assumption, the Turing machine halts in three steps. Therefore, the referee rejects in the first step of this game. Meaning that without even playing the game with the players, it, it, it just rejects. So the value of the third game is zero. That is something that I know. Now using, now using the compression theorem, I know that the value of the third compressed game must also be strictly less than one. That's just a property of the compression theorem. Now, in the second game, again, if you look at the description, in the second game, the referee first simulates the Turing machine for two steps. But we know that the Turing machine halts in three steps. So the Turing machine doesn't halt in two steps. So the referee is not going to reject in the first step. 
So what is, uh, so it's, it, it, it goes on to the second step, the referee, and it computes the compressed games and plays the third compressed game, right? So the value of the second game is the same as the value of the third compressed game. Therefore, the value of the second game is also strictly less than one. Now, if I do this argument one more time, I get that the value of the first game must be strictly less than one. And that's what I wanted to prove. I wanted to show that if the Turing machine halts, the value of the first game is strictly less than one. So we've done that. Now, uh, the other direction of the proof is that if the Turing machine doesn't halt, I need to show that the value of the first game is one. So for this one, I'm going to use the other property of the compression theorem, the one in green written on the left side of the slide. So how am I gonna do that? Uh, well, by construction uh, of the games, uh, well, I know that the Turing machine never halts, so the referee never rejects in the first step. So the value of game G1 is always the same as the value of the compressed game G2 or G2 compressed. So, and now by the compression theorem, I have this inequality. Now, if I just rearrange the terms in this inequality, I get this other inequality. And now by induction, uh, I get that, I get this other inequality here. And now if I send n to infinity, I get that um, the value of the first game must be one, okay? Just some simple algebra. So we are done with the proof. Uh, we reproved the Slavstra's result. So, uh, all right, so we, we, we showed that uh, the exact value problem is, uh, is as hard as the non-halting problem, right? We reproved this result by slough throw. So what about, what about the, the, our pi two results? For our pi two result, uh, it, it just follows very similarly, but, but we combine two different compression theorem. One compression is the one that we saw from, uh, uh, you know, when I introduced you to the compression theorem, I gave you this uh, one compression theorem. So we use that theorem. We call that a gapless compression theorem. You know, I'm not gonna tell you um, what does it mean for, to be gapless. And then there is another compression called the gapped compression theorem. That's a consequence that, uh, of, of MIP study plus RE result. We combine these two, uh, we interleave these two uh, compression theorem in a very in a, in a careful manner uh, in order to obtain our results. So uh, schematically, we have uh, this result: exact value is complete for pi two. That's the main result of our paper. So, and we have there are two compression theorems. One is the gapless compression theorem, and the other one is the gapped compression theorem. We combine these two, we obtain a stronger gapless compression theorem that allows us to prove this statement. Now, Slavstra proved uh, his theorem using group theory and approximate representation theory. In particular, he did not use any compression theorem at all. But I'll show it to you that in his argument, there must be a compression theorem hiding somewhere. So in fact, assuming any of the reduction we saw so far, any of those uh, uncomputability results, one can prove a corresponding compression theorem that matches that, uh, that result. So, uh, so I'm going to show you that compression theorems are necessary. Uh, here we show that uh, the reduction from non-halting to exact co-value problem implies a compression theorem. So let's see how that goes. Uh, so uh, here's a theorem that we are going to prove. Given a sequence of games, Gn, one for every integer n, there exists a single game G sharp such that 
the core value of every single game GN is one, if and only if the core value of the G sharp game is one. This is called a super compression. Um, as you can see, I'm, I have a family of games and I compress it into one single game. Uh, so it is a stronger than the compression theorem we saw before. Uh, and, and in fact, that, that compression theorem follows from, from this other compression, from this super compression. And uh, here's the proof idea. I have a sequence of games, GN, I produce a Turing machine T sub G using this sequence of games. And then I use the reduction from non-halting to exact co-value. So that's a reduction that takes a Turing machine and produces a game, right? So I take this Turing machine uh, and uh, use this reduction from non-halting to exact co-value to get another game. Uh, and we call it the G compressed game or G sharp. And that's the uh, G-sharp in the, in the statement of the fear. Uh, so from, the, uh, from this reduction, we know that if the Turing machine halt, doesn't halt, then the core value of the compressed game is one. That's, that's, that's what we know from the, from the reduction. So now, uh, in order to complete the proof, I just need this extra uh, requirement. I need that if the Turing machine doesn't halt, then for every N, the commuting operator value of the N scheme is one. That's all I need. So again, I want to construct this Turing machine such that it has this property. Here, here, here it goes. Uh, this Turing machine for every enumerates over enumerates all integer n's one two three four, and for every n it enumerates over m from one to n, and it computes the n's STP in the MPA hierarchy that we saw from before. On the m's game, and it halts if and only if this STP value is strictly less than one. Now clearly, this Turing machine never halts if all the games in the sequence have co-value one, right? If the co-value of every, every game in the sequence is one, then the STP value never drops below one. So this Turing machine never halts, right? And so this Turing machine has, has really the property that we want. But, but uh, all right, so I, I told you that you can, you can prove a lot of things using compression theorems, but how, how do you prove compression theorems? Uh, and I, and I, the compression takes, takes a game and produces a game with much smaller description, right? So, uh, you know, we start with a game, its referee has some complexity and we compress it, we obtain another game with this much smaller referee. But it does that at the cost of making the players more complicated. So now the players in the compressed game, G sharp, needs to go to a much larger Hilbert space and use much more complicated measurement operators. So this is, this is the reason basically why classical games, games with classical players cannot be compressed. But because in order to compress, you need to make the, uh, you know, make the players go to a larger Hilbert space, but in classical, classical players are, are just working with one dimensional Hilbert spaces. There is no room uh, for, for enlarging the uh, Hilbert space. So this is the reason why the, uh, uh, the, the classical multi-prover interactive proofs. Multi-interactive proofs with, with classical provers uh, have the same power as non-deterministic exponential time, whereas multi-prover interactive proofs with entangled provers um, are the same as RE, the sort of all uh, recursively enumerable languages. All right, so 
Um, if I have lost you in the details of the conversion theorem, I'm, I'm now going to, uh, for, for a few short minutes, just uh, switch gears and talk about something entirely new. The main ingredient in the proof of compression theorem is what uh, is known as self-testing. Self-testing is an important property of some games. Informally, we say a game is a self-test if the optimal strategy is unique up to isometries. And every time we advance our understanding of self-testing, uh, we were able to obtain stronger and stronger results in quantum information. For example, in computer science, better self-testing has led to uh, better cryptographic protocols, verification protocols, stronger complexity theoretic results, and so on and so forth. In a moment, I make uh, clear what I mean by better self-testing. Uh, self-testing uh, results are traditionally proved as follows. So you have a game G and uh, you want to show that it's a self-test. This game is a self-test. So you pick a canonical optimal strategy S for the game G. So this consists of a Hilbert space, a vector psi and operators for Alice and Bob. Uh, then you show that for every other optimal strategy uh, that uses the Hilbert space H hat, vector psi hat, and operators A hat and B hat, there exists an isometry from H hat to H that sends the vectors and operators uh, to the canonical uh, vector and operators, psi and A. This effectively shows that uh, the state psi is unique up to isometry. So that's, that's uh, um, but uh, the problem is that construction of this isometry, uh, this isometry V uh, is, a, is quite a daunting task. We understand that sometimes uh, it is necessary to find out exactly what this isometry is. But for example, in our work, we never needed to establish the existence of this isometry. And that relieved us from uh, a lot of complicated calculations. So let me elaborate this. Uh, we know that given a game G, there exists an algebra A with the following property. Every optimal strategy of the game G is a representation of the algebra A. Sometimes specifying the relations of this algebra A is all that is needed in a self-testing application. For example, operators in any optimal strategy of CHSH must anti-commute with one another. Similarly, optimal operators for in, in the magic square game either commute or anti-commute, depending on which pair of operators you're talking about. But, but there are also a lot of other uh, interesting uh, algebraic relations out there, not just commuting and commutativity and anti-commutativity. Finding this algebra A is much easier than constructing the isometry. In fact, to the best of our knowledge, finding A is usually, finding this algebra of relations is usually the first step in any self-testing proof that we know of. So this is the algebraic view in contrast with the conventional uh, view of self-testing. All right, so I mean, uh, um, I think I'm out of time. So I, I kind of start just right here. Um, maybe I can... Yeah, just like end it at, at this diagram. Uh, that we talked a lot about during the talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> so maybe one, because Alex is not here to ask you that question. But, uh, so you mentioned that so the, the self-testing property is commonly used in uh, so in verification and crypto, so uh, like in which sense? 
so in so in the proof itself, so you can embed this self-testing as a property, or so you, you need it as an underlying assumption, or what, how, how do you implement that? Yeah, so like uh, one uh, really uh, huge advantage that you have with uh, uh, with uh, in settings that you have self-testing is that you can uh, you can uh, delegate. Uh, um, As, as, as the honest party in, in, in a cryptographic protocol, you can delegate a lot of the computations that you need to do to the players, and you can be sure that uh, they must follow uh, the, uh, uh, the honest strategy, because uh, otherwise you'd be able to catch, catch any, 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 uh, uh, any way in, in which they try to conspire against you. Right, so the self-testing is telling you that if they want to win this game, uh, they must be following this rigid uh, procedure. Right, this is something that you do not have in the classical setting, and and it can be advantageous when you want to delegate computation or when you want to uh, design cryptographic protocols. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can ask a question. So you, you mentioned non-commutative polynomial optimization at some point. Uh, could, yes. could you remind me again, what, what was your result exactly? Did you relate like any polynomial optimization problem to a game? Yes, so, um, so you reduce the com computing the value of the game to a non-commutative optimization problem, right? Given a game, uh, well, the main um, object you want to study is the value. Right, and uh, the value is 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 uh, can can be written as as a, as a non-commutative optimization problem. You have uh, a, a non-commutative polynomial in Alice and Bob's operators, measurement operators, and uh, and you have some some. Uh, inequality constraints the, uh, in the positive semi-definite column, right? You can always uh, describe uh, the task of computing the value of the game using using an optimization problem uh, like this. So, so and I, so it... So I, I think I was more asking if you, if you showed something for the other direction, because I, I think I remember, maybe I misremembered that you, you showed some uh, equivalency. That's right. So we know that the uh, the value uh, we know that uh, not committed optimization problem is complete for the class pi two this largest class in this diagram here right so one direction is to show that uh, it is inside pi two and uh, that you can do uh, directly you can you can. Uh, given any non commutative optimization problem, you can uh, come up with the pi two algorithm. Uh, that uh, that uh, that computes its value. So uh, you know, the, it was for the other direction that you need to use games, right? You want to show that it is in Pi two and it is complete for Pi two. So the hardness to show that it's Pi two hard, uh, you do what what I said about like you know uh, using games and its their values, but to show that it, uh, the non commutative optimization problem is in Pi two, you just uh, uh, you can just explicitly write down uh, uh, an algorithm in Pi two uh, that solves a non-commutative optimization problem, and that, that's and, and it's a very simple algorithm. It's just an enumeration. So for every dimension, um, uh, you go over all possible uh, solutions to your non-commutative optimization problem. Right? It's it's very much similar to this search from below algorithm that I told you about. Uh, that, that I told you for uh, non-local games. Okay, thanks. No questions? Okay. In the chat. Thank you. Maybe just one. Could you you skimmed over this, but could you just very briefly say something about the open questions? Oh, for sure. Um, so, of course, the most important one is uh, what is uh, the complexity of the approximating the commuting operator value, right? So here are all the re results uh, that we know. Uh, the exact 
exactly computing the value of the gain is the result of this paper. We showed that it's pi two complete. Approximating the value of the gain is sigma one or RE. That's the MIP star equals RE result. Exactly computing the value of a commuting operator value of a gain is pi one. And the conjecture is that approximating the commuting operator value is also pi one. So there is this um, um, a difference here for 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 tensor product value of a gain. Uh, it's uh, 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 the, uh, exactly computing the value is strictly harder than approximating the value. Whereas uh, if the conjecture that I just mentioned is true, then approximating and exactly computing the commuting operator value of a game has the same complexity. Okay, so that's the main distinction. Uh, another open problem is that, okay, so we saw that computing uh, the value, the ex uh, exactly computing the value of the game uh, is complete for the class pi two. Uh, the question is, are there other natural questions about non-local games that go beyond the second level of the hierarchy? Like, is, the, is there a game associated, is there a, a computational problem associated to non-local games that um, require you to go all the way to pi three or sigma three? Uh, but, but there are, there are many other uh, open problems related to self-testing. Uh, so we really are just starting to understand uh, what's possible using non-local games. And uh, you know, what, are the, what are the things that can be self-tested? What groups can be self-tested? What algebras can be self-tested? Uh, can, can, can these algebraic structures be self-tested efficiently and robustly? Uh, what are their connection to representation theory, operator algebras, complexity theory? So there's a whole host of open problems related to self-testing. Like the, the most important uh, uh, ingredient in the proof of compression theorems, I hope uh, I conveyed that, is, uh, is this self-testing thing, right? The most important, uh, the most difficult part of MIP study was our e-paper, for example, is a self-testing result. The most difficult part of our paper is a self-testing result. So if you have a streamlined proof of, of these results, then, then uh, you would hope to have, to, to obtain all these uncomputability results uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a simpler manner.